I did I, I did reclaim Novik's abode to be clear. He doesn't still have it outside. <laughs> Well, good for you for getting that beer back. Everybody, welcome to Beers with Bill. It is my pleasure to welcome back Kat Rogers Hearn, Short Finger Brewing co-founder. Kat, welcome and thank you for joining us while you were on your vacation. By the way, happy anniversary. Thank belatedly. you. I love the picture of Rob and you well, with Mabel on, on the patio. You put in Facebook, that was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, our anniversary looks a little different this year. Last year at this time we were uh, on a canoe trip, we were doing backcountry in Algonquin Park, uh, and so I was doing a two-kilometer portage, twenty weeks pregnant with Mabel. So she is not into that yet. So instead, oh, we went to Arabella be. Park and had a beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 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 so happy to have you back on the show, and um, I'm glad to be I, back. <laughs> I, I would like to know which beer you wanted to start with tonight. Oh, Des Moines. I'm like sweaty from rocking this child to sleep tonight. Yeah. So I would like to start with the really refreshing one. Um, okay. Mine doesn't look like yours because I have the unlabeled low fills. Yeah. Uh, so yours has a label on it. It's some sort of monster, one of four options. <laughs> so yeah, we are starting with Des Moines. Um, Des Moines is named for our canoe, uh, and we decided to make Des Moines because we love tripping uh, and drinking old style Pilsner uh, while tripping uh, because we're classy like that. And so then it made Rob decide that I could probably try and make one of those. Um, and so we decided that... Uh, it would be one of the first loggers that we ever made out of short finger that was actually a clean logger, um, which like objectively making clean loggers in a mixed fermentation brewery is a terrible decision uh, that is sure to backfire eventually. But until that time, it's yeah. just a lot of fun. Rob and I've had many conversations when we talk about doing collabs about the fact that you can't do that. This is a mixed fermentation. You're going to screw it up. And I'm like, yeah, I know, so what? It'll be interesting. Um, to the question, how do you define old school pills? They're not old school, old style. It's the name of a beer. Uh, it's just called old style Pilsner. And it's just a dirty, dirty, delicious Pilsner. Yeah, that's all. Uh, so this is, but it is also a Czech style Pils, um, which is what this is. Uh, so it's something that I very much enjoy. So if you haven't tried yours yet, please do. Tonight's gonna be interesting because um, I'm usually like really well prepared for things like this. Um, and for Des Moines, very well prepared, have probably consumed my body weight in Des Moines. Um, I have not tried this year's No Fixed Abode, nor have I tried Lando FP. So this is gonna be really fun to see what I taste because I don't know the answer to those things. Um, but this one should just be like a clean, classic, uh, fairly traditional, which is not a thing we normally do. Um, a Czech style Pilsner. Uh, in terms of differences between Czech and German, uh, Czech tends to have a bit of a, a maltier backbone, um, less of a sort of spicy assertive, I mean assertive is not really a word you would use to describe the hops in any Pilsner, but less assertive than you would find in a German for sure. Uh, so in this case, we're kind of talking like, you know, crusty French bread, small forward, a little bit of a softer um, sauce hop, like herbally tea, flavor on the end there. Um, but basically the intention is for it to be something that's light and crushable that we can take on a canoe trip um, and drink in the sun all day and not drop the canoe on our heads while we're portaging. That's it. That's all it exists for. Totally apt, to, totally apt description, Kat. <laughs> yeah. So um, how do you decide what beers to brew in the brewery? Ooh, um, we decide based on what we want to drink. Uh, so, period. Um, we are, no, that's actually, that's a lie. Uh, I would say pre-pandemic, we chose based on what we wanted to drink, period. Um, now, 
we choose based on what we want to drink and also what we know will sell enough to let us keep the lights on while we brew the things that we want to drink. Um, so the lager project is just something that uh, we basically are doing for fun um, because we enjoy a good lager um, and all of our mixed firm stuff falls into the category of things that we make because we want to drink them. Um, our original sort of like more original pale ales, uh, definitely true believer. That was one of the first beers that we had planned when we started the brewery. Um, Midnight Bike Club for sure will drink all day forever. Um, but basically anything like higher alcohol or uh, dark that we've released lately or full of absurd things like peanut butter and bananas and uh, bacon, for example. Uh, those are things that objectively we made to keep the lights on in the brewery, um, not because those are beers that we necessarily want to drink, right? Like, um, you know, we released a mint chocolate chip imperial stout that we called Soul for Sale. Like, I feel like that's a little bit telling, right? The only description on the back of it is the tax man's coming, we got to bleed. So... <laughs> And that sold better than most of the beards that we make on purpose. So here we are. <laughs> you know, the pandemic's been hard on a lot of people. Um, I'm curious what the hardest hurdle was for Shortfinger or for Cat to overcome at the beginning of the pandemic. Oh, my God. Uh, well, OK. So we can talk about cat or we can talk about short finger and those are very different things. Uh, we did our embryo transfer for the child that would become Mabel uh, one week before the world went into lockdown. Uh, so, so personally, the hardest thing at the start of the pandemic was immediately being pregnant. Um, for short finger, the hardest thing was for sure losing the tap room in the patio um, because we had never packaged really in any significant way. We bottled uh, for bottle conditioning, specifically and exclusively the beers that we intended to be sellerable um, because our belief was that anything that's consumed, intended to be consumed fresh is best consumed fresh in house, out of a keg where we can control it. Specifically, especially as a mixed firm brewery, um, then we really have a handle on where things are at. Um, so for us, it was really hard to be like, oh shit, like people can't come in here. Um, we can't sell growlers endlessly because we don't want your growlers back. There's a pandemic and we don't know how this thing spread. I don't want to touch your germs. Um, so, you know, we did growlers for a while and then we shut that down. And then we basically had to build slash buy a canning machine because suddenly we had to package everything. And that for us, for sure, was both logistically the hardest and also just like the most expensive pivot <laughs> that we've ever had to do. Oh, Graham, that's a very small seller, but I appreciate it. <laughs> is it called a seller if it only has one bottle in it or is it just like a closet? It's a fridge. Okay, that's not a seller, it's the wrong temperature unless well, it's it, unplugged. It's in the bottom of the fridge. Okay, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it hiding for the perfect moment to take it out and try it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, Katie, the canning equipment has paid off for sure. Um, we are definitely enjoying canning some things. Um, we are enjoying personally the ability to throw cans, not throw, don't throw our cans places and then open them and then complain to us that they foam. So not throw, gently place cans into our backpacks with an ice pack and go to the park and drink beer in a can which you shouldn't do because it's illegal. Um, but, uh, you know, so like we're selfishly, at the end of the day, short finger is still mostly just like a selfish undertaking. Uh, so selfishly, we are enjoying cans now that it's happening, but it took a while. So I'm curious, you and Rob started out, you, you're both in the beer industry, but you guys started out homebrew. Yes. And being a homebrew supplier. Yes. How did the decision to open up the brewery happen? So the brewery was always the plan. Um, when we decided to leave Toronto um, and leave what we were doing there um, and start over, and we 
decided to start our own thing. The conversation was always that the brewery was part of the end goal, um, but that as home brewers, um, we wanted to also be continue to be part of the homebrew community. Um, and logistically, um, it's a lot cheaper to open a homebrew supply store than it is to open a brewery. Uh, we had no investors. We started with only the money that was left over from selling our house and buying a new house with the down payment. And so it was just like anything that's left is what we have to start with. That ended up being $60,000. Um, and we, so like, we just, we didn't have the money to start a brewery yet. And so it was sort of like, well, we'll start the homebrew supply and start building our brand and getting our name out and being involved in the community. And then when we can and as we can, um, we'll continue to grow from there. And so, that's basically what's happened. And now we are also a brewery and that took longer than we thought it would um, from when we started because short finger six now, but the brewery's only three. Um, we figured it would be like a year or two before we started the brewery, but we also didn't think that the homebrew supply side would be as uh, successful as it was. And so we got way busier with that than we thought we were gonna get with that. And we kind of just had more fun doing it than we were anticipating and so everything else just kind of got backburdened for a while uh yes derek we will continue canning for sure we i mean like we bought we bought slash built a canning system at yeah. this point we've invested money we're going to keep doing it <laughs> yes i i was there when rob started making that unit work right that's the thing right there's like also it's not like we can really easily sell the canner if we decide we don't want to can anymore because it's not going to make sense to anybody it's janky as all hell we built it from spare parts like nobody wants that <laughs> it was expensive <laughs> but nobody wants it uh, but rob had a great time doing it let's be honest <laughs> <laughs> there were days there were days when he had a great time doing it oh there I were was... days when he came home and he was like we're done. We're just going to close the brewery and move to the middle of nowhere. It's fine. I'll get a job at Sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. There were times at the at, I, he would message me when I was closing up kickoff and I'd be like, do you want me to come over and give you a hand? Like, honestly, I'll stop on my way home. I know how frustrating this is. Yeah. And it, Nope, I'm almost done, but man, am I frustrated. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. and I think that's part of it, right? There's always going to be frustration um, yeah. when you're doing something yourself and it's something that you care about, like you're invested. So you're going to get angry sometimes. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, Gravenhurst is in the middle of nowhere, but Gravenhurst is in the middle of nowhere compared to like KW <laughs> and Toronto, because we also came from Toronto. Um, I'm from Saskatchewan where I didn't have you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you brews really don't affect, um, homebrew stores and the homebrew community almost at all. Um, from what we've seen, um, because it tends to be, uh, a different group of people that are going for the you brew, um, than wanting to, you know, get into the equipment and spend the time and do the whole brew day. Like you brews essentially going and pitching the yeast, right? Um, it's a really different, tactile experience to do the homebrew yourself. Um, and so for the most part, I find that there isn't too much overlap or people will start with you brew and then eventually get into homebrewing, which actually just kind of helps us. So yeah, hasn't been an issue. So you've opened up the brewery, but you guys started in the first front two units of that building. We did. Yeah. Where a wooden boat is now. We actually started yeah. just in the front unit. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, six months later, we took over the back unit. And then, well, so we actually, that's okay. That's all a lie. We started in our basement. Uh, so we were in our basement for the first year. Um, and so some of you might remember <laughs> coming to our basement. Yeah, I, I know the mic does while it was being uh, renovated. Uh, it was just like a sheer construction zone. Uh, it was a disaster. So that was the first year. Uh, and then we got the unit that Wooden Boat is now in. And then we took on the unit behind that, which we have since taken back again. We gave it up for a few months. Um, and we like cut in the floor drains and started building the brew house. Um, all of that while we had first right of refusal on the space that we're in now. Um, but the people that were in that space, um, it was a construction company and they left with two or three years left in their lease. 
So we were not anticipating getting the space for another two to three years. Um, and so our landlords came to us and they were like, hey, you have first right of refusal, but if you don't take it now, basically like you are waiving that right. And who knows if or when it'll come back. So then we had to move almost three years ahead of schedule, uh, which was terrifying. Um, and yeah, so that's now what I was gonna. That's what I was yeah. gonna ask you. What did it feel like the first time you stepped in that huge space? I mean, like I almost vomited. If I'm being honest, it was just sort of like, are we insane? Um, because literally like Rob had already been in there. I had not yet. So he's like, let's just look at it. Like, we'll just go in together. It'll be fine. And we like went and we took Harley, our dog at the time with us and like had a ball and Rob just like threw the ball across the warehouse and Harley just like, it just, it felt at the time, like he was just running forever. Uh, and then he's a hound. So we didn't get the ball anyways. He just like pissed off, but, um, but yeah, like it was, uh, I think mostly because like we were hoping to be in that space eventually, but because we were so far away from feeling like we were ready to do that move, um, it felt a little bit like, is this the right decision? <laughs> ah, we'll see. Yes. And maybe it was still to be determined. What do you think has been the most positive change because of COVID? Hmm. I think the gift of time, to be honest. Um, the one benefit, I guess, of packaging so much more, um, and this is like, <laughs> this is not a benefit to anyone but us, the benefit of all the bars closing <laughs> and not having draft is that we had to move everything in house. And so, when the whole world is open, there's a certain pressure to be producing and releasing fairly continuously and fairly quickly and in a manner that doesn't necessarily make sense for what we're trying to do and what we value, especially on the mixed fermentation side. Um, and so we tend to prefer to do things slowly. Um, and with the world shutting down, somehow, even though we were doing a lot of deliveries and we were you know, still selling a considerable amount of beer and people were pivoting to bottle shops, it still somehow felt like it gave us a bit more control over release timeline um, on the things that we did care about. Like, yeah, we had to pivot and make like a ton of IPAs and pale ales and like the darkest timeline series, which ended up being kind of fun, but, so like, you know, that happened too, and that's not necessarily my favorite part, but it did allow us to sort of really slow down um, and have a bit more intentional control over our mixed fermentation program and our sour releases, which was, which was nice, yeah. Jen's curious, when or how you know that <laughs> it was a good decision to move into a bigger space? A very good question. Um, uh, when will we know? I think, and it, maybe the answer is we won't, um, but certainly there, when we got into this there, we always talked about like in five years, this in five years, that right. Like we're a new business. And so in five years, we'll be able to take a vacation in five years, Rob won't be there 70 hours a week in five years. And then the conversation became, okay, well, the homebrew shop's five years old, but the, and now the homebrew shop's six, but the brewery's only three. So is it in two years? That we're going to be able to do that or is the fact that we moved from what we knew that we could probably keep a handle on into 6,500 square feet does that mean that that five years is extended I don't know so we might know if it was a good idea in, in two years when the brewery's five according to our original plans um but I also you know this is the first business we've ever owned might be the last but so there's also just kind of an unknown factor of like was it realistic to think that maybe someday we'll be able to slow down or is the reality of life just like <laughs> that doesn't happen unless you have a ton of money to throw out the business in the beginning. Um, so I don't know if or when <laughs> we'll know if it was a good idea, but <laughs> I hope it was. 
always a good idea. Look at all the room he has for barrel aging. Right? It's funny to which think Which he didn't have. I know. And it's funny to think about because the original plan was that the homebrew shop was going to stay in the unit that Wooden Boat's in. And the brewery, including the barrel program, was going to be in the back unit, which is 500 square feet. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that plan went out the door really early because I remember talking to Rob and helping him load a barrel one day on the truck to move somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cloud City will be back in stock on June 20th, 2022, because we only release it on Lando Day. Yeah. It's a once a year release, so it won't be back till next year. Which beer did you want to talk about and taste next, Kat? <laughs> So much Des Moines left. Okay, hold on. Uh, let's talk about Lando because I feel like no fixed abode risks being a lot on our palates. <laughs> Should probably save that for last. So yeah. So uh, if you are drinking a Lando at home, you may or may not be drinking the one that we put down, which is FP, which is our most recent Lando release. Um, FP stands for French Punchin. Uh, which is just the, the vessel that we fermented 80% of this blend in uh, and aged it in. Um, if you have a different code, that's also cool. We can talk about that if you'd like. There are a lot of them at this point. Uh, and admittedly, we have not been doing a good job of updating the website so that you know what is what. It's on my to-do list. But like, so sleeping and I prioritize that. I think that everybody here knows that, that Mabel is the number one priority in your life. And the website is somewhere down at the bottom. I'll get to it if we're and when I get to doing, it. We're actually doing a full website redesign right now. It's getting pretty crazy with the homebrew yeah. side and the brewery side and just so many products. And like Shopify wasn't really built for what we do, um, but we're making it work. Uh, so uh, Mike, our homebrew store manager, is in the process of working through like a pretty significant yeah. <laughs> website redesign. And thank goodness for him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this batch is nice. I haven't had it before. It's a little bit more tart than the ones I've had lately. I like it. Um, so Lando, if you are new or new-ish to short finger or just don't care about what we care about, um, Lando's our baby. Um, I mean, like Mabel's our baby, obviously, <laughs> but like our beer baby um, is Lando. Um, and it is the thing that I think year over year and batch over batch, we are most proud of. It is also the thing that we are, um, I would say we're really careful with all of our beer. We have no problem pouring things down the drain or blending it out if we're not happy with it, but we're really particular about what we will release from the Lando series. <laughs> Mabel's middle name is not Lando. I would not let Rob. Give Mabel a beer name. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, yeah, so anyways, uh, this batch of Lando um, is 80% uh, uh, was aged in the French Punchin, uh, which I mentioned. 10% uh, is uh, Billy D. Uh, and so Billy D is our basically like an old older aged for longer unblended version of Lando. Um, so this year's was aged in fourth use red wine barrels for 18 months. So we put 10% um, Billy B in uh, just to add a little bit more depth and interest in the back end. Um, and then uh, the remaining 10% um, is fresh Lando. And so there's always a certain percentage that's fresh. It's usually either 10 or 20. Um, but every, every Lando release that's called Lando is a blend. Uh, and we are constantly working on that blend. Um, her middle name is absolutely not Black Label because I, same thing, no beer names. <laughs> No beer names, alcohol names, no nothing. I will not do it. I will not do it. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, how much variation is there in fresh in batches of fresh? Not a ton. Um, some, right? Because again, like we're always using our house yeast, which is still ultimately always kind of evolving because it is a yeast and bacteria blend, right? So it's just kind of doing its thing and we're 
take were its caretakers. Um, but I mean, it's the same base recipe. The only thing that changes time to time with the fresh Lando is the hops. Um, we're always using aged leaf hops. The aged leaf hops that we have available and ready to rock change time to time um, because some of it is stock that we've been given from other breweries that were like, shit, we opened this and forgot about it and didn't use it. Do you want it? We're like, it's gold. Yes, we do. Um, some of it is like old homebrew pouches that we manually poked holes in. Uh, some of it is just like, you know, extra from hop yards in the area. So the kind of the only significant, not even significant really, because there's not a lot of hops in it, but the only sort of noticeable change in fresh batches of Lando would be um, the hop character. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, so that's uh, the current blend. All blends of Lando um, are uh, like I said, include some amount of fresh. They don't usually include Billy D. It's just that we were getting ready for the uh, Lando Day release. And so we were pulling it anyway. So it made sense to put it in. Usually we'll be blending different batches of Lando um, that we've aged in different kinds of wood or that we've aged on fruit or whatever. Um, so in this case, there's no fruit added. There's nothing funky added. Um, it's just French punch and Billy D and fresh. Um, so I like these versions always because they are the ones that let the house culture shine the most. Um, there is our, our fruited sours always sell better. Um, I don't usually like them as much. I like, I like the complexity that you get from hanging out with yeast, but I also acknowledge that that's the nerdiest thing I'm going to say tonight. So here we are. Um, the different wine barrels yield drastically different flavors. Absolutely. For sure. Uh, different kinds of wine, right? Like a Chardonnay barrel is for sure going to yield different flavors than like a Pinot Noir barrel. Um, but also we use our barrels a lot and for a long time. So in some cases, um, the intention is to use a fairly freshly emptied wine barrel so that you get a lot of the flavors from it. In other cases, we're using a barrel, you know, three or four or five times um, because we don't want the character anymore. We actually just want like the neutral oak. Uh, and so our whole Lando A series, we're now at, we've released A to AD. Um, those are all neutral oak. That's all things that we've used enough that they're totally stripped of flavor and we're, it's just the Lando flavors coming through. But yeah, like the difference in barrels for sure is like so significant between all the different types of wood that we're using and, and what they were used for previously, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, not back home in Saskatchewan, but like Rob and I did undergrad at Trent. We drank everything. <laughs> Most people that go to Trent University are there as much to drink at the pig's ear, which is now closed as they are to go to university, so. I can't hear you, Bill. Is it me? I can't hear you, Bill. Can't hear you there. Oh, it's not me. Not that Bill, I'm happy. I can't hear you. Technical difficulties Ooh. being nope. right now. Yeah. Hi, Kat. Am I there now? Hi. You are. Good. Was barrel aging always part of the process that you intended to do at the Royal? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, it, both because we really enjoy barrel aged beers. Um, Rob, when he stopped working, um, in Ontario craft beer briefly, he worked for uh, a Belgian importing agency called Horizon Beers. Um, and they were not importing the kinds of beers that we're now making and that we really enjoy. Um, he was importing like Trappist beers and Duval essentially, which are great, don't get me wrong. Um, but they sort of got a, that became like the gateway into all things Belgian for us, um, which led us to Lambics, which is basically where we live now uh, in terms of our happy place. Um, and so for us, the intention was always to barrel age, both because of the beer that we drink, but also because 
um, the homebrew shop was always intended to be part of the picture. The homebrew community was always intended to be part of the picture. And in the end, we thought it would be most interesting for us to focus on producing the beers that are logistically harder to produce at home and on a homebrew scale. Our thought was that we could provide the tools and ingredients and education for anyone who wants to make beer to make really good beer at home. Um, but it's hard to develop a really interesting mixed fermentation program at home. It's hard to develop a really interesting barrel aging program at home. Um, and so we thought that we would focus on the sort of the niche that our home brewers um, had less access to. Was kind of the original intention. As it turns out, uh, very few of our home brewers actually drank our beer. Uh, so that didn't really play out the way that we thought it would. <laughs> but whatever. Terry Newman got the great question. What's your favorite? Uh, what was your first barrel aged beer? Oh, Jesus. Uh, my first barrel aged beer was, and I don't remember which one, um, but it was uh, for sure Russian River. Uh, Russian River for us was like, so it wasn't actually Belgian, uh, it was American. Uh, yeah, Russian River was like goddamn mind blowing um, the first time we had it. And I don't remember which one we had first because we picked up like several at a bottle shop and basically had them all at, yeah, <laughs> all in the same night. And it was like, what the fuck is happening? Uh, it was amazing. Um, yeah. And it was like also the first time we went to the Tornado in San Francisco. It was the same thing. It was just like, what should we try? And they were like, here you go. Uh, and so, yeah. So for us, that was like, oh my God, beer can taste like this. Wow. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, yeah, I think it's largely because homebrewers want to drink their own beer, right? Like if you're making it yourself, also if you're making it yourself and you're making it regularly, you're going to have a lot. So either you need to give it away or you need to drink it. So a lot of homebrewers just like aren't buying a ton of craft beer because they're making so much. Um, but we also found that um, a lot of our homebrewers who do drink our beer, uh, certainly not all of them, but a bunch of them just have no interest in mixed fermentation at all. Um, and so when we started making pale, uh, like pale ales, et cetera, to pay the bills, it was like, oh my God, these are amazing. And we're like, screw you. <laughs> really? That's what you want to drink from us? You can make one of these at home so well. Just do it yourself. Don't make us do it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite barrel aged beer at Short Finger? At Short Finger? At Short Finger. What's your favorite? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, probably Lando AB. So our second neutral Lando release. Um, Lando A is also amazing. Um, but Lando AB, our second neutral release, I... We, we, so we always kind of keep the cases of like the last bottles that we fill off the bottling line because they have the most sediment in them. We don't want to sell yeah. that. Um, so we hold them back and we just keep throwing them in our cellar. And every time we open one of those bottles, it is just an absolute joy. Uh, and they are definitely getting better with age. Um, yeah. And yeah, so AB I think is probably my all time favorite barrel aged short finger beer so far yeah right so, so far Lauren's sure. curious if you're planning on doing more spontaneous beers yes for sure um we had a lot of fun doing it um deus ex machina was our first one uh and that's just because logistically we're three years old so we don't had we didn't have more than you know three years in tank we didn't want to release um a young spontaneous uh you know same thing i mentioned earlier about the joy of slowing down um Rob's intention always was like an uncompromising, we're doing this and we're doing a three-year vertical blend. Um, so until we had three years worth of spontaneous ready to go, uh, we couldn't do it. So now we'll continue doing spontaneous basically annually. And the next time there is a three-year blend ready to go, it will come. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask you some questions about cat, if that's okay. Yeah. So. So the, so the first one that would come out of my mind, what would I find on your playlist today? 
<laughs> um, okay, like my musical playlist? Yeah, your musical playlist. Okay. So, um, oh, Derek, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm just dodging, but <laughs> I do appreciate it. Um, okay, so my musical playlist these days is a lot of like, why well, put music on in the background to entertain Mabel. Um, and so Mabel and I listen to a lot of Elton John. We listen to a lot of David Bowie. Uh, we listen to a lot of uh, one particular playlist on Spotify that's called like Good Morning Oldies, but it's like not oldies, it's just a bunch of like, or no, sorry, Happy Morning Oldies. I don't remember, I'll look it up. Anyways, it's like, just like super happy classic rock, except every once in a while, they'll throw in a song that you're like, probably shouldn't be on here. It's not actually happy. That's a Vietnam War protest song. Um, you know, so like Spotify, not perfect. Um, but yeah, so my musically, it's a lot of just like what I can put on in the background that has like a good beat for my infant to dance to. Um, when I have time to myself, my playlist is usually podcasts or audiobooks. Um, currently I'm getting caught up on my favorite podcast, which is called Ologies. It is a science podcast. Every episode is about a different ology and it is hilarious and charming and very, uh, educational. Uh, and it is, yeah, hosted by a, a science journalist and science like TV show host named Allie Ward, who I really like. And so Ologies is what I listen to when I am not trying to affect the musical tastes of my seven month old child. <laughs> That's great. Which would also lead me then to my next question because I know that you're a, more of a librarian by trade. What book would I find on your bedside table? Ooh, also a good question. Um, so what is on my bedside table right now? Currently nothing because we're packing to move in terms of like hard copy books. Um, but also um, because it's really hard to read hard copy books with a baby, um, which I did not anticipate when I got pregnant, but like it's a freaking nightmare um, to have like two hands free at the same time, mostly. And so um, I have taken to, uh, I have the Overdrive app on my phone uh, and I have a, uh, my library card to the Kitchener Public Library includes digital subscriptions. And so I listen to a lot of audiobooks and I read a lot of eBooks because then I can just use one hand and flip on my phone. Uh, and so currently on my list, uh, I am reading The Entangled Life, which is about fungi. Uh, it is a nonfiction book by a gentleman named Merlin Sheldrake. It's basically a book about mushrooms, and I warmly recommend it if you have any interest in foraging or fungi. Uh, and then I'm also just starting a young adult book called The Gilded Ones that I am previewing to add to our library collection in the fall. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Um, Derek, we are not doing a thousand books before kindergarten at KPL because I am the school librarian at a K-12 school and I have 2,500 picture books in my collection. So I'm just going to take those. <laughs> Good answer, Kat. <laughs> Let's talk about the last beer. Cool. So um, the last beer is a just delightful project. Um, collaborations are something that we um, take pretty seriously. Uh, we will not collaborate with a brewery or in this case cidery um, if we don't see it as something that is mutually beneficial in terms of opportunities to learn and fun to be had. Um, so we don't collab just for the sake of collabing. Um, Tarek is super fun to collaborate with um, because in the cider world, he shares a lot of our values um, around experimentation, around playing with fruit, around wild yeast and bacteria, um, around, you know, taking things slowly and, and giving things time. And so No Fixed Abode has been super fun. This is the second No Fixed Abode release. Uh, it is nothing like the first release. Uh, except in terms of the base. So the base of both releases has been a blend of our Lando um, and their Perry. Um, the first time we did it, it was just like chocker block full of uh, pineapple. 
and we released a still version and they released a carbonated version. Um, so this year we did it a little bit differently. One of our homebrew customers lives uh, about a hundred meters away from the brewery and he's got a crab apple tree. So he offered us all of his crab apples. Uh, so we took his crab apples and then Tarek um, for the EB wine side of his business had Marichal Foch grapes. Um, and so we both threw those in and then we split things. Um, and then we uh, basically each kind of went our own way. So we put um, a uh, small beer, like a low alcohol saison that was uh, punched down on Pinot Noir skins and ours and uh Tarek blended uh some Grovert Straminer into his so both versions are a little bit different um but both of them are like very pretty and delightful and they're both carbonated this year which is a new fun change um they are pretty assertively carbonated so if it's not quite cold uh make sure that you have your glass ready to go um because it you know gives you a little bit of fun and yeah, like I said, I actually haven't dressed. <laughs> it's fine, whatever. Um, but man, it smells so funky. This is everything I want my beer to smell like. It's got like a little bit of like must happening, a little bit of grape skin happening, a lot of funk happening, just like a touch of poopiness happening, which people swear is not a good thing until you go real deep and then it's the best thing um yeah this smells super fun to me and behold it is um for me one of the important signs of a well-made beer is that your flavor experience follows your aromatic impressions um anytime that doesn't happen that's a bit of a red flag for me um, and so, especially when I smell something and I'm like, oh my God, this smells amazing. And then I try it and I'm like, wait a minute. Um, that didn't happen here. So I'm pretty happy. Uh, yeah. So it's just a super fun blend. Um, for us, it's less of a big deal to play with, you know, Perry and add in, um, alternative fermentables. It's a bit trickier in Tarek's side because being a cidery, you're you know, pretty safely gluten-free. So this is one of the few things he releases. <laughs> his collabs with us and his collabs with Burdock are kind of the few things that he releases that are like, be careful, my gluten-free friends, you may not enjoy this beverage. Um, we don't have to do that because nothing that we make is gluten-free, so it's fine. Yeah. So Kat, I'm curious, yes. Yes. would you share with us? Because I know I know you, 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 you were part of the, um, <clears throat> there it is. Mind eludes me. The organization at, at Wellington Brewery, the Queens of Brew. Queen of Craft, yep. Queen of Craft. And um, you do do brewing. I was wondering if you share with us what you would might consider your epic best fail. Oh, God. In brewing? In brewing, or have you never had one? And you don't have to share it, by the way. <sighs> epic best fail in brewing. I don't know that I've had an epic fail in brewing, um, particularly because it has never been my full time all the time. And I've been able to choose when to engage, how to engage and who to engage with. So I get to play it a little bit safer <laughs> uh, in that respect. Um, and so I, there's nothing that comes to mind is like, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. Um, just because if something doesn't feel right to me, I just don't do it. Um, there are definitely times when I have felt like out of my depth in this industry, but usually it actually ends up being like totally fine um, because I do a lot of research and over prepare for the world. I totally understand. I'm still looking forward to the opportunity to do a collab with you. I am totally down whenever you want. I know. I know. Yeah. Whenever you want. Yeah. When Rob, Maybe we'll when, have to when come, you, when, so as long as you that. But. When you and Rob get back, shoot me a message because we should probably talk about the next one. Perfect. We're back tomorrow. So I will okay. message you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, 
I'm curious who your role model is. That's a really hard question. Um, just like anyone. I'll leave it open to you to interpret it. Okay. Cool. 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 Um, okay. In that case, uh, my role model is probably Mabel's namesake, um, who is my grandmother, uh, who is no longer with us. She's been dead for three and a half years. Um, but yeah, if I could like model my life after any human being who's ever walked the planet, um, she'd, she'd be really high on the list. And certainly of all the people I know, she'd be at the top. Um, she was just super, um, on one hand, strong and pretty badass and unapologetic, but on the other hand, um, compassionate and empathetic and open to learning. Um, in a way that I think a lot of people, myself included, struggle with. Um, she lived until she was 95, right? She grew up in a time when people look at their grandparents and they're like, ah, oh, like, of course they're racist. They're in their 90s. Or like, of course they're homophobic. They're in their 90s. Um, my grandma wasn't those things because she worked really hard to learn um, and to adapt and to acknowledge that she grew up in a time where the world was different, but that that wasn't necessarily a sign that that was what was right in the world. Um, and so, yeah, I think if I can go through my life and be both unapologetic about not taking any shit from anyone, but also, um, you know, keeping an open mind and learning continuously and continuing to value humanity first, um, then I will have had a very successful life. She sounds like an amazing woman. She's incredible. Yeah, yeah. she's incredible. Yeah. What's the best advice you've ever been given? Probably shut up. Um, and I don't mean that in just like, a, like <laughs> shut up. Although I've also been told that and sometimes it's really helpful. But no, just in terms of um, for a long time and, and still I have days um, where I speak first and think later. Um, I'm getting better at it, but anytime I've ever said something that I regret, it's because of that. Anytime I've ever done something I regret, it's because of that. Um, and so I think just like, shut up, listen first, think first, then say what you wanna say um, is, yeah, probably the best advice I've ever given. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, on the surface that, that doesn't sound like good advice, but I, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> if you could spend a single day, and I'm going to say brewing with anybody, who would it be? But if you could spend a single day with anybody, who would it be? Okay. Um, brewing, uh, it would be uh, Danny Plignon from Fantôme. Um, we spent a day with him already when we were in Belgium last time. Um, accidentally, we intended to just stop in, grab some beer and leave. Um, and then we were there for like six hours and he took us out for lunch and with his extended family, it was delightful. Um, but it's very Belgian, <laughs> but, um, he is somebody that I have a lot of respect for in brewing, both because Fontaine is delicious. Um, but more importantly, because, um, he is someone that I see a lot of parallels um, in the way he approaches his business and we approach ours. He has a very small operation that he still um, operates almost exclusively by himself. He gets help with bottling now. Um, he still brews what he wants to brew when he wants to brew it. Um, he finds ways to get it out in the ways that make sense to get it out, which is something that Rob and I have actually been talking about lately um, because our, you know, like as much as we can make pale ales and, and the Darkest Timeline series to pay the bills, it's not what we care about in, in beer. Um, so his willingness to and commitment to exporting when he needed to export, Belgians don't drink Fontaine. 90% um, of his beer goes out of country. Um, which was an insight that I was surprised by from him. And so I would love to spend a day just like brewing from him, learning from him. He's got a really weird old 
janky, awesome brew house with very low ceilings. Every time he goes through a doorway, he has to like, he like hits above it to remind you and himself not to hit his head. Like Terry would be screwed. Um, but Emma, you'd be fine. Uh, I didn't, I didn't have to duck. <laughs> you'd be fine. Um, but uh, yeah, I would like to brew with him. I think it would be a lot of fun. Um, and I also just, I think that people who've been in the industry for as long as he ha has have a lot of wisdom to impart either intentionally or otherwise. Yeah, so he'd be my dude. Jen's curious if you could export, where would you export to? Oh man. Um, assuming that export laws were not an issue, let's start there because export laws are a nightmare. Yeah. Um, I think across Canada. I think ultimately, would it be fine? Like, would it be fun to send things to Berlin? Would it be fun to send things to Belgium? Would it be fun? You know, of course, for sure. Um, but one of our values as a brand has always been community and being close to home. And if exporting makes sense, I still think we don't want to compromise more than we need to on the sense of community and keeping things close to home. And so I would be way more interested in sending beer, you know, into Quebec and out to BC than I would be in sending things to different countries. But interprovincial trade is still a bit of a nightmare and we're small enough that it doesn't really make sense for us. I hear you on that. Is there a style of beer you wish you had made that you haven't made yet? No. Okay. <laughs> That's basic and simple. No. No. The only style of beer that I wanted to make that we hadn't made was a dark mild and I just made one. So yeah. Like now Catherine the Mile exists. Uh, that was the kind of only style that we weren't producing that I wished we were. Um, but no, otherwise we have made every style that was on my, like, we got to do this list. There are some others that we'll do just for fun, but no, there's nothing that I'm like, oh, I just wish. I've already done them, right? <laughs> yeah, or I just don't care enough. <laughs> and Rob doesn't care enough, so like. One last personal question. Mm -hmm. With everything that's gone on, you know, you were pregnant through the beginnings of COVID. You've had Mabel now. You're in the midst of a move. How does Kat stay grounded? She absolutely does not. Um, <laughs> like, that's not a thing. Like, literally, Mabel woke up at 1130 last night. She didn't go back to bed until three. And I was, like, sobbing. Um, like just full, like I had a panic attack at one point last night. I was just like a real wreck. Uh, cat does not stay grounded. Cat is a hot mess on the best of times when there is not a pandemic or a seven month old who hates sleeping. So like, if you add those things in, cat's not grounded. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, thank you for being honest. No problem. <laughs> I would expect nothing less. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not grounded. Don't be absurd. <laughs> What's the one thing you would like all of us to take away from this chat tonight? Um, this is the hardest question you've asked me. It's the last one. Oh God, Graham, I hope Mabel's grounded one day. That's not the takeaway, but like, Jesus, do I hope that she takes after her father more than she takes after me. <laughs> um, what do I want to be the takeaway? You know what? I'm going to I'm going to go back to beer and I'm going to go back to my nerdiest comment of the night. Can we all just love yeast more than we do now? I mean, some of you do, and that's and I love you and I appreciate it, but can we all just acknowledge that yeast is the ingredient that matters? You can keep your 16 kinds of hops. You can keep your additions of crystal and five other kinds of malt. Give me an expressive interesting yeast and basic everything else bacteria too love it can we just acknowledge the yeast where it's at and we should all love it and we shall appreciate it and we shall take care of it yeast is my takeaway from tonight that <laughs> uh, it's very philosophical thank you yeast <laughs> makes it all happen <laughs> yeast that's what we need to take away it's the best Cat. Uh, Thank you for joining me tonight. It is always a pleasure to have you on my on the show.
any time. It's super fun. I know fun. that. I know Everybody that. Everybody else, I'm sorry that I am not grounded. Oh, Thank not you at all. For trying these beers with me for the first time. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Adam Wilson joins us next week. Uh, Adam's in the middle of a transition. You will be getting an email from me later tonight for the beers that he has chosen. Um, he's no longer working for Boschkung. That was a thing that happened only in the last two days. So, yeah. He, he agreed to be on the show anyways, and so it took some time to figure out what he wanted to do for his tasting. Again, Kat, thank you. Thank you. No problem. It was fun.